Thank you. I can see that some of you are old enough to remember the old General Electric motto, better living through electricity. I'm going to adapt that motto to my own purposes for this talk, better brain health through electricity. There's a quiet revolution going on among neurosurgeons and neurologists such as myself. All of the types of invasive surgery that typically are done, which involve drilling holes in the head, sucking out brain, scooping out brain, is now giving way to non-invasive methods for some conditions, not for all of the conditions. And that can't be anything but good, right? I mean, you needed that kind of old surgery, like, to turn a phrase, you needed a hole in the head, literally. So I'm going to use the example of uh, epilepsy, even though the most impressive use so far for minimally invasive neurostimulation is in Parkinson's disease, where 150,000 people have been implanted worldwide and have often had marvelous results when the drugs failed. But epilepsy is what I know, and it's very common. It's more common than Parkinson's disease. There are a thousand people in this room, so 12 of you have epilepsy by the odds. I'm not asking for a show of hands. It's also one of the most misunderstood diseases in the world. Even the word seized connotes being seized by the gods or the devils, depending upon your particular century. It's very misunderstood, and there's a huge inappropriate stigma against it. Nevertheless, the way seizures travel through the brain and what they do have had a little silver lining in that they've taught neuroscientists a lot about how the brain is organized. Uh, epilepsy is a spotlight uh, on the brain. Now, 1.2% of the world has epilepsy, and a third of those people don't respond to medications, so treatment is inadequate. But I'm going to make the case for you that we're on the verge of a mini-revolution by which non-invasive methods, such as brain stimulation, can make a big difference, and when we learn how to treat diseases with brain stimulation, we will quite possibly also learn how to enhance normal function, so we can make all of you smarter and better athletes. Not that you're not smart and great athletes already. So how did I get into this? I've seen thousands of seizures, but I've never had a seizure myself. I came in through the avenue of research when I was a Caltech student. I worked with Professor James Olds, who discovered the so-called pleasure center of the brain, although he never called it that him, himself. But uh, laboratory rats would be implanted with electrodes in those pleasure centers and given a pedal to push to turn on stimulation. And after a while, he had to take the pedal away because they wouldn't eat, they wouldn't drink, and they would eventually collapse from exhaustion. But they felt good when they did it. <laughs> I then moved over to Professor Roger Sperry's laboratory. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize for elucidating the nature of consciousness, at least partially, in the verbal left brain versus the nonverbal uh, visual gestalt uh, right brain. And those experiments were done in people with epilepsy whose hemispheres had been surgically separated to keep the seizure from spreading. And at that point, I first became interested in epilepsy, and when I went to Stanford, I joined the laboratory of Dr. David Prince, uh, one of the world's foremost epilepsy researchers, and epilepsy has been my career ever since. So what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is the disease with spontaneously recurring seizures, and a seizure is an electrical storm in the brain. Over the centuries, many famous people have had seizures. You can see world leaders, artists, writers, entertainers, athletes, and on the bottom of your screen you can even see a Supreme Court justice. Not the most recent one, although locking beer a lot probably can cause seizures. <laughs> okay, too political. <laughs> <I do. laughs> so, I'm showing you this slide. Um, to indicate that you can achieve great things with epilepsy, but if your seizures are uncontrolled, it is really hard to have a good quality of life. So what do we do about that? Well, the mainstay of treatment for epilepsy is, of course, medications. All the way from bromides, which were originally uh, at a time when epilepsy was thought to be a form of insanity, 
and bromides were used to reduce sexual drive. Wrong theory, but the bromides worked. We now have 26 medications in the US and a 27th, the newest one, uh, just approved by the FDA and the DEA, uh, which is cannabidiol, the marijuana extract. It's going to be a very helpful drug, I think, although not the magic bullet we're looking for. You know that if we had a magic bullet, we wouldn't have 27 drugs. We would just have one. So what do we do then for uh, choosing? How does your doctor know when there are 27 medicines from which to choose? So an experienced clinician, whom I define as someone who's made the same mistake so often that she or he doesn't make it again, uses something called clinical judgment. And I'm sorry to tell you that that really doesn't work very well. That a lot of times when your doctor chooses a medicine, the doctor is guessing and you're gambling. And if you have epilepsy or another disease, uh, you pay the price in terms of lack of effectiveness and side effects. There's a big change that's happening in medicine now, and you've heard about it today in some of the other parts of the conference. That's the use of machine intelligence or artificial intelligence in order to help make better decisions. We could, in theory, put in your genome, all of the enzymes in your system, all of your past medical history, your response to prior drugs, and somewhere in there, in those thousands of pieces of information, would be the best guess for what the best medicine is for you. But it's too much for a human mind to comprehend, particularly the interactions. Yet that is where a computer with deep learning, properly trained, can really make an enormous difference. And with the hosts of our conference today, uh, we're engaging in a uh, project to start that, to see if machines can choose the best seizure medication. It, it's my hope as a little bit of an old guard sort of person that the machines will end up being a great assistant to the physician rather than a replacement for the physician. But time will tell. So this is what's wrong with medicines. They don't work for a third of the people. They're inconvenient, and you may forget them. They have lots of side effects. They can cause birth defects, and they're expensive. For some people with epilepsy, surgery is an option, but it's a minority. It's for people who have seizures from a well-localized place that's safe to remove. And even some of those people don't want us cutting on the uh, brain. So what is the alternative then? Well, Fortunately, we live in an age of technology. If you come to the Stanford Epilepsy Center today for a temporal lobectomy, the most common type of surgery for epilepsy, chances are, instead of doing drill and suck and cut, uh, we're going to make a very small hole in the back of your head, pass a thin laser fiber under direct MRI vision, and burn out the small area of brain we want to remove sending you home the next day. We probably could do it the same day, but we're afraid to do that. Focused ultrasound is even less invasive. That's an ultrasound beam that's from outside your head that makes small holes in very precise location in your brain without even cutting you open. It's approved, uh, and we use it for treatment of tremor, someday for epilepsy, I think. We can deliver light pulses to brain by fiber optics that will either excite or inhibit neural circuits, depending upon the color of light that we use. We can control the brain activity moment to moment. I'm participating uh, in design of a trial in Australia with my colleague, Dr. Mark Cook, to infuse drugs into the fluid channels of the brain, where we can achieve 10 times the concentration that you can get with a pill without much more in the way of side effects. And the preliminary results are quite exciting. There is a device, not yet available, but tested and published to predict seizures. And how different would your epilepsy be? How much better if you had a radio pager on your belt that said, you're going to have a seizure in 45 minutes. Please pull the Tesla over to the side of the road and take a pill. <laughs> It would reduce the uncertainty of seizures, which is one of the worst parts. So this, this uh, is reality, and I hope 
will become available soon. As an aside, I have to mention that every time I talk about seizure prediction, I'm asked about seizure predicting dogs, and my answer is maybe, but I'm pretty sure that cats can predict seizures, but just don't tell us. <laughs> Why should they bother? So the last block on the slide is neurostimulation, which, um, after all this meandering, is the focus of my, uh, my talk. The first neurostimulation was the vagus nerve in the neck. This has been going on for about 15 years now. The vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic system, which controls heart rate, digestion, secretions in the lungs, goes all over the body. I suppose you could say what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. <laughs> but some of it uh, spreads up to the brainstem and makes the electrical activity of brain stem, um, much, it makes it much harder for a seizure to originate. Uh, so over time, there's about a 50% improvement in, in seizures. But our thinking is that we could get even more efficacy if we put electrical stimulation to counteract the seizures directly into the brain centers involved with or connected to the seizures. So that was the next uh, advance something called deep brain stimulation. This is the same uh, type of stimulation and, in fact, the same equipment that I mentioned for Parkinson's disease before, just put in a different uh, place of the brain. Uh, the stimulating electrodes are in the head and the wires are tunneled behind the ear, all under the skin. You can't have anything protruding or it would be infected. It goes to a, a pacemaker on the uh, chest, which is about the size of a cigarette lighter and has batteries that last about five years, and then the device needs to be replaced. If it doesn't work, it can be taken out, but no brain is taken out. So that's an advantage over conventional epilepsy surgery. This is an example of uh, someone who's a neurosurgeon and really quite a neuroshowman, Professor Jose Delgado, a neurosurgeon uh, at Yale with one of the first public uh, displays of deep brain stimulation. He implanted a, a DBS electrode in the motor control centers of a bull, controlled by a radio paddle. He then went into the arena until the bull charged him, and you can see that I protected the privacy of the bull according to the <laughs> medical requirements. Charged him, and he pushed the button on the radio transmitter, which caused this very confused bull to start going in very fast, very uh, tight circles instead of uh, charging. And in the beginning, there was not much science behind deep brain stimulation, and therefore this was not the only time that DBS was associated with uh, a lot of bull. But uh, <laughs> we've, we've, in the ensuing, we've in the ensuing 50 years done a lot of scientific experimentation. We've got it on a much firmer footing uh, and I think uh, there's something, uh, something very much to it now. Uh, this is the uh, pioneer for epilepsy, Irving Cooper. I think he looks like George Bush, except better looking. <laughs> and uh, Marcus and Francisco brothers, one a neurologist, one a neurosurgeon in Mexico City. They did the early pilot studies. Um, I kind of took over in order to do the controlled scientific studies that you really need uh, to decide that you believe that something works. The theory behind it was stimulating a pacemaker area in the brain that has widespread connections, something we would call the node of a neural network. And through work in my laboratory and others, we found that the anterior nucleus of thalamus had good connections to the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, which are the two lobes most involved in seizures. Here's an experiment from my lab showing all those up and down black spikes, which are epileptic discharges in a rat brain, and stimulation of the anterior thalamus at each point where it says start interrupts the seizure activity. So based on the laboratory work and the pioneering work of Cooper and the Velascos, we decided to go ahead and do a uh, randomized placebo-controlled experiment. And let me just make a pitch here as a clinical researcher. Um, in the beginning, you do pilot experiments and you just shake the things out so you know the right parameters to stimulate and get some sense of whether there's any efficacy and safety. But if you're serious about any medical procedure, you need to insert a placebo group 
you need to randomize the patients. Uh, and most of the medical literature does not do this, and therefore a great deal, take it from me, an external editor, most of the medical literature is junk. A little scary that we base so much on junk, but we're getting better about it. It shows implantation of the electrodes in the thalamus, and in the middle panel you see the two of the wires in brain, and then in cross-section the two little black dots at the yellow arrow. Those are the targets of the anterior thalamus. This uh, somewhat busy slide is a summary of the randomized clinical trial that we did. Down is better. It means less seizures. You can see the dotted red line on top is placebo with an average 14.5% improvement after three months of double-blinded treatment compared to 40.5% improvement in the group that had five volt stimulation in the thalamus. And that was uh, statistically significant uh, enough to convince the FDA to uh, approve the uh, treatment just recently. In the box is the time when we turned on the stimulator for those who were on placebo stimulation because we did not think it was ethical to put wires in people's heads and then give them nothing. And when we turned the stimulator on, even though they didn't know whether it had been on or off before, they went uh, down to the efficacy level of the other group and it continued to improve. We think that there's changes in the brain that happen over a period of time here beneficially, such that by about two, three, four years, uh, you're on the average down to one-third the number of seizures you had before, and 15% of them were seizure-free for at least six months. Not too bad, because they were having 20 seizures a month at the start. And then came the next advance, the next wrinkle. This method stimulates for one minute and it rests for five minutes, then it stimulates for one minute again on a clock cycle. Wouldn't it be even better if we stimulated when seizures occurred? So this device is a EEG machine, a marvel of miniaturization, which is inserted directly into our patient's skull, continually recording EEGs, and then stimulating, as you can see in the bottom trace, to stop the seizure. Even better would be if we could do it non-invasively with magnetic panels on the outside or transcranial direct electrical current, both of which have shown efficacy in some studies, but not all, and those two treatments are not yet FDA uh, approved. I would say kids don't try this at home. There's been discussion of boosting cognition and athletic ability with brain stimulation. I think we possibly we'll be able to do that, but it's your brain you're fooling with. Do it in a medical environment. I close with mention of Terminal Man, Michael Crichton, 1972, a prophetic book about brain stimulation. And my conclusions. Epilepsy is a brain disease, not a mystical vision. It's common. You may have it. Meds and sometimes brain surgery are the mainstays of treatment. Technologies delivering new treatments, particularly neurostimulation, and the future will bring better health through electricity. Neurotechnology may be expensive, but if you're worried about that, I commend to you my favorite fortune cookie of all time. Money spent on the brain is never spent in vain. <laughs> Uncle Lee's House of Szechuan. Thank you very much.